The World of Dick and Jane. Dick, Jane, and Sally who? They have no last name, but it doesn't matter. Family matters. A fun-loving, secure family where everyone plays and nobody yells. A happy family where the kids are free to be kids and are so good that mother and father never say no. A traditional family with a pretty mother, a handsome father, two kind and generous grandparents, three well-adjusted kids, not too many, not too few, and a menagerie of equally well-adjusted pets. A family where everyone is trusting and shares a sense of humor, the kind of family every child and every parent wants. Welcome to EXO episode 24, Carry On. This episode is about a friend of mine, a guy named Ken, but to explain first how I met this guy. When I first started doing podcasts, I did a lot of derivative kind of stuff, you know, kind of trying to do what I'd heard other people do. It never worked out as well as what they were doing, obviously. When I finally hit on my own thing, it was basically the idea was just to walk around outside, just to walk around in whatever city I was in and just talk about what was on my mind or what I was up to. And then I would play songs to sort of stitch it all together. And I thought it was really kind of a cool thing because the sound quality obviously hurt a little bit. It's not as good as people in their home studios and stuff, but I thought it made up for it because I was out in the world, you know, I was in weird locations. I thought that made it kind of interesting. And I also like the idea of just talking to yourself. Because I feel like that's when you get the most sincere thoughts out of a person. Because there's nobody there making them feel weird. They're not being observed. It's just them talking to some phantom future audience. So then when I moved to Toronto, I got an email from this guy named Ken who goes by the name the Scarborough Dude online. And it turns out that Ken's idea for a show was to record when he's out in the world. Could be sitting in his car outside a bar, could be at a park near his house, could be at an airport in Japan. But record out in the world and talk about whatever was on his mind and then put in songs in between. That motherfucker came up with the exact same idea I did, except he did it three years before me, and he's 31 years older than I am. It's fucking amazing that a guy his age is even into podcasting at all and came up with my revolutionary idea way before I did. It's like, shit, man, come on, fuck. So Ken runs a podcaster night here in Toronto where a bunch of podcasters all get together and hang out once a month. And it's really cool. I get to meet a bunch of new people and got to know him a bit and listen to his show. Ken's podcast is called Dicks and Janes, which is the name of an old zine he used to edit. A lot of times it's just, you know, kind of day-to-day stuff. It's not, you know, it's just the millstone of life. But every once in a while... You hit these veins, you hit these runs where Ken would start talking about his past especially. Those were my favorite parts because he's about the same age as my parents. So to get this view of the world that he's from was really interesting to me. So that's what this episode is about. It started with just a clip he put in about a lady from his job that just annoys him. And it really cracked me up because it is... It's kind of unfair, it's sort of petty, he's just like, man, this lady drives me bananas. But it's so relatable, you know, I know exactly what he's talking about, I've been there. And then from there, it just slid into these really great stories about, you'll hear it, it's, it's fantastic, just all kinds of good stuff. XO number 24, carry on.
Dicks and Janes. Do you remember? Do you, does Dicks and Janes mean anything? Dick and Jane. Yes, yes, of yes. course. Who are who are Dick and Jane? Tell yeah. our tell our listeners who are they. Well, Dick and Jane are early reading. Are they? Exactly, we learn early reading. Exactly, right. exactly. Yes. And this is why I grew up reading Dick and Jane. Many of us grew up. I, I'm born 1948. Dicks and Janes. I've used this kind of a generic title to mean any man, any woman. People who grew up kind of uh, naively in the in the 50s and had a good oh, life, oh. and then suddenly the 60s hit us very hard, and our lives went topsy turvy. And we discovered we, we came under the influence of people like Timothy Leary and yes, Allen Ginsberg, yes, 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 and yes, it changed yes. our lives forever. There was no going back. Welcome to uh, Dixon Jane's podcast number 270, 270 That would be. 271 hour shows I've given you. That's that's a lot. And it's been fun. I've really, I say I've given you, but I've really given myself uh, an, an hour's time, you know, of uh, just the free time that goes with podcasting and how much, how, how relaxing and how satisfying that can be. Not for the end product, but just for the uh, the doing, the doing of it. I forgot the reason I had uh, started recording, and I, I, my day started off, and I came into my office, it's fine, now there's a lady who works next door for a printing company, design company, who for some reason I just don't like, I know why I don't like, she's a certain type of woman, the kind of woman I hated, girl I hated in high school. Who just you'll never have any in-depth conversation with. And she just represents a certain type I just fucking can't stand. I want to just puke when they're in him. I want to be so rude. So usually I keep my office door closed because I don't even want encounters with her. Like Today she came in and she sort of stops at my door with that big smile, you know. Well, my son finally decided. I'm thinking, oh, fuck, here we go. I, you know, I don't know you. I don't know your son. She's leading. She's bursting down something. He saved all his money. He's taken it all. He's going to take the plunge. Yeah, okay, he got me hooked. Yeah, I'm supposed to show. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even looking up for my tweets. I'm just trying to ignore her. I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to buy a MacBook. He's going to buy a, a portable computer, a Mac. Okay, yeah, so like, you know, I'm supposed to be impressed. It's, you know, he's earned it. He's worked for all that money. And from his summer jobs and his Christmas and he saved it all and he's decided he's going to buy his computer. His first one. I'm like, I don't give a fuck about you, you know, and your son. I just don't fucking care. It's like these people who write these goddamn Christmas letters that they send out and every fucking kid in the family is doing fantastic and Everybody is, and they send this out. It's like a slap in the face to everybody they know. Look, 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 look what we're doing. Look how good we are, you know? Fuck you, you know? I, I mean, God, I hate that. That's what I, I, one of the reasons I started Dixon Jane's Azim was to be real, you know? To say what people really like. You're up, you're down, you know? You're, this shit about this. Like, what, why is she trying to impress me? And so I muttered something, you know, while you're, uh, you know, not worried about him, spending too much time on it, you know. Oh, no, he's so good. He's really good that way. No, he's never a problem. No, he's an A student, and he's good at all sports. Fuck you. God damn it. Like, what's... Why does she have to share that? Why does she have to tell me that, you know?
Here I am. I'm really proud of my kids. Now, number one son just flunked out, flunked out university, and he's, he's trying to get back in after a disastrous year. Smokes weed, you know. Well, actually, he's given it up. Good for him. I'm proud of him. I'm, I'm proud of them because they're real and for who they are, not because they're going to impress somebody else. They're mine. Are they're my kids. I love them, and, and I love them the way they are for who they are. Number two son did his best ever on this summer course he's taking. He's taking summer school because he, you know, he flunked courses here and there. Well, good for him. He did it on his own. He registered. He's come. You know, he hasn't missed a day. He's doing really well. He'll probably get an A on the course. Great. His best mark ever. And uh, as I'm driving in, he says, oh, darn, just forgot something. I said, oh, what? 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 What did you forget? My cards. I play cards every day with the guys. And that's not the kind of thing a mother would brag about or a father would brag about. But I'm thinking, oh, good for you. You didn't know anybody at this school. But you're having fun in your free time. You've made friends. You went to a movie with him yesterday. I'm just proud of him. But not for these fucking goddamn superficial reasons that other people are like. Look how good my son. My son saved all his money, and he's getting a computer on his own. Fuck you! Fuck you! I hope I hope he drops it and it breaks. I really do. It just bugs me. If you're that kind of person, fuck off. Don't sit beside me. Don't tell me about your children. All right? Cockroach in my car? Get the fuck out, buddy! Oh shit! Oh fuck! All right, anyway, I gotta go. Bye. First set of batteries, and here we go. Yeah. I'm uh, Monday morning, November 1st, in Buffers Park, of course, because today's my day with no uh, classes, but I am going to, I'm on my way into the office to uh, mark some papers. I think I'll have a productive day, but uh, time out first to come to the park. It's cold. Today's the first day I woke up with the... Uh, Windshield of my car completely iced over, like completely. And uh, God, I started driving my son to school and I couldn't see. That's a sign of winter. And of course, his words were, God, I hate winter. I've hated it since I was 10 years old. And, uh, but I just, I said, yeah, but when you're old like me, you see beauty in everything. You see beauty in all the seasons. (laughs) 
And maybe that's what draws me to the park. Maybe it's just a, a, a sign of age, and, and it's not one I regret at all. Because I, I bet you I have a lot of younger listeners who would, quite frankly, be bored. Coming to a park, sitting on a bench, and uh, just kind of toasting in the sunshine. The sun is reflecting off the lake. I can't, I'm blinded. I look up, and I'm just, it's just, oh, that, that brilliance across the water, you know, the dazzle, the dazzle. And I can't see at all. My glasses, I'm sure, have turned to black by now. Uh, it's a beautiful feeling. I've got my down vest on and a lovely, lovely scarf that uh, Catherine Matthews kindly knit for my uh, 60th birthday present. Got my thermos of coffee. And I thought we'd just talk a little bit. Maybe I'll wind down this podcast now. Uh, I always want that feeling, you know, that I've, I've given you something that you've, you've that has been of value, and not just oh, there's this guy droning on in the background. But I know for some people, it's different things that I talk about. I, I've, there's so many chapters in the past I'd like to go back to. I think of that time in Europe, 1969, because I mean, god damn it now, that's history. 69, 70, wandering Europe with a backpack. Like, what was the world like back then? And uh, then I'm thinking, gee, I never, hardly ever talk about my high school time. What was it like being high school from 61 to 66? And uh, so much more. And then, of course, my relations with my own parents. My father was very close to my mother. I, I really, I had a, I was very fortunate that we had a good relationship with her. I always called her by her first name, Joan, because it, it was just... To me, that's just who she was. I saw her as the person, not just my mother. She was a lovely, kind woman, and uh, who's, I guess, maybe, yeah, I don't think she had ambition, but her, uh, maybe dreams, I don't know, I guess not. I, I think I think she had what she wanted. She had a wonderful man, my father, she married and remained married to their entire lives. They were very, very close. of my own marriage of 24 years and my own two children and the the life I've started leaving. I'm, ju- I'm just glad that my own parents were able to uh, meet my wife and uh, begin to at least get to know my children. And uh, But I'm, I'm sad for my children. Of course, I married so late that they don't have grandparents here that they can uh, visit and uh, spend some time with. is if you just tell a story 
and there's no emotion attached, and you're not emotionally into that story while you're telling it, there's really no point. I was remembering my grandmother because I was reflecting on the generations and uh, how kind and kind of gentle and, and just a good person my own mother was. And then I think back to her mother, who's a very strong character. A real product of the Victorian era. And yes, my roots go back that far. Gotta remember, my mother was born in 1918, I think, or 1916. So, uh, you know, that goes... It goes back pretty far. But I loved her granny, she was my mother's mother. And uh, my grandfather unfortunately died when I was just, before I hit my teens, I guess. I, I liked him a lot. I certainly remember him very clearly. She will love you like a fly and never love you again. Uh, but eventually I think got gangrene from a wound from World War I and... Uh, had his leg amputated in the St. Anne's Vets Hospital and uh, kind of went downhill from there. But I see it's almost like this skip a generation because I see so many parallels between my marriage to my wife, who is, is, is also strong and independent and a product of a certain era in Japan. And my grandparents, my, my mother's parents, and I really see that. And, I, and I, it's interesting because it makes me so curious to know what's going to happen to to my children and uh, who will become their partners, if any. And uh, if they were to ever have children, what would what would it be like and what would they remember? And it's uh, It just fascinates me. And the one memory I do have that ties all this together, and it was it was really overpowering, was when my wife and I left uh, Yokohama. Uh, we had eloped, we'd come back. That was 86, 87, I guess, yeah. We left Japan uh, via Siberia. It was the most wonderful tour. We traveled around the world, like circled the globe to get home to Canada. And it was a tremendous thing. You could go through the uh, Russian Tourist Bureau and buy this package that got you as far as Moscow from, from Japan. And then from there you had to have a ticket out. So we went as far as Prague, Czech, the Czech Republic. It was the most amazing trip. God damn, I should relive that too. You know, I holy fuck, eh? these these memories like that. I, I I never include that one. But I'm talking about oh, yeah, my trip to Europe. Yeah, I went to Africa. Yeah, I went to Japan. I forget that. God damn it, took the Trans Siberian Railway across. And it was an amazing trip with my my new wife and that. The moment of of just horror. When I didn't see her get back on the train, we were stopped somewhere in Siberia, some town. We we got off, we got separated, and I didn't see her get back on, and I got on the train in a panic. Right. 
flying through the coach. It's like I, I just had visions that she didn't have the passport. I was holding that she was being held and the train was going to pull out and there's not another train coming. You know, you don't hail a taxi and catch up to it. And I had visions and I had to make that decision. Do I jump off the train as it's moving to go and get her or to just hope like pray like hell I find her? Sure enough, finally met up with somebody I knew, another tourist. There weren't many of us, and uh, they they had seen her get on another coach. And it was it was one of those like real panic. Like, do you pull a trigger or not? A life and death decision. Do I jump off this train and run in and find her, or jump off and realize I've made the the, the, <laughs> the biggest goddamn stupid mistake in my life? I've jumped off a moving train. <laughs> And left my wife on it, heading off to Moscow alone. <laughs> oh, God, I shit myself at that time. Really? Panic, panic, panic. What do I do? Uh, it was the most amazing trip, but we left Yokohama by boat by this Russian ship that was decommissioned the year after. A beautiful ship made out of, you know, all the interiors, wood and brass, very, very small. There was only, I guess, eight of us as tourists on this little Russian freighter. Can't remember the name of it. Heading up to Vladivostok. So it was a two-day journey, a two-night journey. God damn, I, wow, what a trip. Just as we were pulling out of Yokohama, I didn't even know there, they have this tradition where they tie streamers to the boat and to the shore, and as the boat leaves or the streamers break, it's a traditional farewell. And uh, I was up on the upper deck, up uh, as high as I could be, a very small ship, looking down at my wife on the bow, this small figure, and we were we were leaving. She was leaving her home country, and I don't know what feelings were running through her at that time heading off to Canada on this ship with this crazy guy this tall crazy Canadian guy she had married eloped with and I looked down and I just had this flash of, of it being my grandmother that I, that I, my grandmother she left England to come to Canada in 1910 with uh, Percy to head off to Vancouver Island to, so he could have this plot of land and uh, grow fruit or whatever. It just, there was this, this instant, this very strong vision of that connection in time, of, of this, as she stood there, Almost like the spirit or the connection, the memory, something alive came to me so strong. It wasn't something I, I thought about, it just came to me. My grandmother leaving England. And uh, there was my wife leaving the Yokohama. Uh, 
There you go. God damn, eh? I think I'm going to preempt, 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 is that it? All the other stuff that I've put on this podcast and uh, give you this for what it's worth because I'm kind of in a happy place right now. With my morning coffee and the sunshine and the sparkles on the water. And Go back to my 27-year-old self. When I was 27, and uh, that I've always claimed has been the best summer in my life, who was I at 27? Who did? I had my circle of friends. I was out in Vancouver. I was just heading off, just broken up with my girlfriend. Was heading off to uh, Prince George to get that job on the railway because I had to have the experience of working on a track gang so that I could... uh, earn the, you know, kind of experiences you need to be a real writer, a la Jack Kerouac. And so did that, and then went on from there to spend that fabulous summer drunk up in the Yukon, so best summer of my life. That summer in Prince George, 1975, having a goal, what was your goal? To get a job on a railway gang and and just being persistent and going up there and staying in a men's hostel and for free, you know, for and eating the, the meals that they serve the Salvation Army bums, you know. Basically, that's what it was. And, and going out every day and going into the office for the BC Rail and, no, not today, not today. And finally, at the end of a week, all right, just go down to the track. You know, probably somebody quit or didn't show up and told me where to go and there was the gang you know gang 301 and signed up and got hired on and given a hammer and said bang these spikes didn't know what the fuck could barely lift the fucking hammer was given royal shit for being such a puny weakling how the fuck was I ever going to survive a summer and uh, put some muscle into it boy and lasting and meeting up with the guys from Cornell the boys who'd come down and do this every summer and just get fucking hammered and doped up and blow all their money when they rolled into Vancouver to celebrate. And then having, you know, ending up back in Quinnell, flat broke. I wonder what happened to that gang, Rory and the whole gang. Anyway, getting some advice from one of the other guys who've been around today. Hey, don't worry, buddy. Just the last two weeks. If you can last two weeks, you can last the whole summer. And sure enough, that's what I did. And uh, managed living in a bunk car, you know, a dirty old blue bunk car with a, a real wood stove inside the bunk car. And uh, getting out on the track six days a week, 10, 12 hours a day or more, and uh, being fed all you could possibly eat just for the sake of saying, hey, I'm a fucking Jack Kerouac. That's who I am. I'm a railway bum. I'm going to tell stories, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to live the life. And I'm proud of myself for that. I'm proud that in my 27th year, that's what I got up to, that I just said, yep had a plan and followed it through and made it happen and had a, just a great summer and saved a pile of money and then went up to the Yukon and got drunk for two months. Holy fuck, man. Yeah. Met up with my buddies from Vancouver as planned and spent that summer drunk around the clock like what a what a fucking wonderful thing to do with a life how many people have done that spend a summer drunk every day happily drunk merrily drunk traveling too up to Dawson City traveled to Alaska hike the fucking Chilkoot Trail a four day hike 
hauling heavy backpacks over the top, deep in snow. Dude, tell me about the first time you did fucking LSD in fucking Tangier, Morocco. Now that's a fucking story. How many people are wearing that fucking badge? Fucking LSD with the heavy duty, cool drug smugglers in Tangier. Dude, try it. It's cool, man. So you show me right your time. And going out there and having the most amazing fucking trip on blotter acid for the first time ever, including being on a beach and having Moroccan police with these hooded jalabas coming up with a gun right to your gut, pointed at you, like saying, hey, who are you and what are you doing here in French? And me being as cool as could be. And you got me. Don't worry, I speak French, sure. We're just tourists, man. We're just living down the road there. No, we don't got no passports. And meanwhile, everybody's carrying their hashish and their boots and their hash pipes. And we're on. My friend is freaking out. And they're not police. I've seen these guys before. You know, demand to see their papers. Hey, Pete, good, man. They got a gun pointed at us like, hey... It's our blood and sweat, and life is what you manage in between. Yeah, man, fucking Tangier, Morocco, doing ass. That's who I was, man. Fuck, when I was, what, 20, that'd be 1969, 1970. A young man backpacking through Europe had to get down to Morocco, man, because that's a trip. So I guess maybe what I'm saying, what I'm wanting to say is, I'm not just this old fucking man at 62 talking boring stories about his teaching and his class. I've had a whole fucking life to live, man. I've lived it. I've lived it rich. I've paid the price. Maybe I'm going to pay the price, and I wouldn't trade any of it, so fuck you. Fuck you, meaning not you, the listener, but you, the guy who's always on my back saying, hey... All your friends have got pensions. They're happily retired. Their futures are set. They'll live till they're 90. They're okay. Their houses are paid for. Yeah, well, fuck. They didn't do what I did. And if I had to do it all over again, God, I hope I'd have the balls to live the life I led. Because it took fucking balls. All right, I know it sounds like I'm bragging. I know. I know it sounds shitty to say that. Hey, look at me. But maybe I'm feeling just a little bit. I don't know. Feeling what? Feeling, what do I have to prove? Why do I have to prove it? You know, that's it. I have to prove something to maybe some of you younger listeners out there that, hey, fuck, man. You won't crack at it. Don't fucking live a life of regrets. Don't fucking just follow that straight and narrow and keep your security in your comfort zone. Because, yeah, what I did was make myself fucking uncomfortable. Going off to Nigeria, living in a fucking bush village, man, that scared the shit out of me. That was fucking uncomfortable. Getting as sick as a fucking dog. 
get malaria, having the most painful fucking needle I've ever had in my life shoved deep into my buttocks, you know, with a guy laughing as I cried, you know, with the pain. Crawling on the floor with this fucking fever. Jesus Christ, you know, shitting yourself silly from just eating the wrong thing and making a mental note. Okay, don't drink palm wine from that guy. Heading off to fucking Japan on a one-way fucking ticket, man. I'm a fucking hero. That's what I'm saying. I'm a fucking hero, and I don't mind fucking saying it. And fuck you if you don't like it. I'm a fucking hero. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know that's very offensive. You're not allowed to say things like that about yourself. But fuck you. So I won't get my Medal of Honor. I'm giving it to myself. You're a fucking hero, man. You spent all those years, you spent years drunk out in Vancouver, drunk and stoned and wasted the 70s, that wasted time. But fuck, hey man, it was fucking Vancouver in the 70s. Explored the gay scene. No, I wasn't gay, but my best friend at the time was. And going out to those clubs with him, that was cool. That was neat. That was a scene, man. Trace of reason, no matter where you turn. And the walls will fall, affirming nothing. So what's it all about? It was fun. So shake up your life a little bit. God, I hope I'm recording. Shake up your life a little bit. Don't be too fucking comfortable. And I hope if it's too late and you're already locked in to your comfort zone and can't get out, that you did something before that that was not comfortable. Because that's what I'm saying, man. Because I felt I was a little wimp, I had to do this stuff, I was pushed to do this stuff. I'll show you. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, man, now let's let's refine that a little bit. Let's not just shout at your listeners. Let's try and refine it just a bit and actually give a story. How about that story in in Mexico when you went to fucking Mexico and you, and you picked, you hand-picked the fucking psilocybin mushrooms in the cow shit at dawn. You went out there because Alvin knew which ones to get. It was the ones with the purple ring around them. Pick those, man, you'll be okay. And then fucking stuffing those things down your mouth with bread and marmalade and washing it back with Pepsi-Cola and then fucking, oh, 
holy shit, we overdid it. We had too fucking many, and we stayed in Palenque, and it's the most beautiful fucking Mayan jungle ruins, sitting on the corner of temples, found my spot on this planet this time now. I'm sitting here on the edge of this fucking Mayan temple, as high as I'm ever going to fucking be in my whole goddamn life. Holy fuck, man. Wow. Tripping and tripping and tripping and tripping and tripping. Hallucinating at every fucking thing you looked at. And going through this scene when this woman came up to share this pineapple she had in the forest. And I'm thinking, fuck, man. I lost my knife. I can't go. And now I think I think about that. It was like it was emasculated. Like, hey... Why is she asking me, this beautiful woman, to go off into the into the forest with her and share some fruit? And I'm thinking now, no, man, they might have been killers because she had a boyfriend with her who came after her, and I might have had my guts ripped out. Ooh, maybe it was good I didn't, and all those other things that tried to drive me from that corner, and I just said, no, man, this is where I'm meant to be, here, now. Now I feel good having those memories and looking back at the richness, the fabric of my life. I feel fucking good now. Proud of what I've done. Fuck you and your fucking pensions and everything else. God damn it. Told you the story off to Japan, eloping, running away with a wife. What a fucking adventure, god damn it. Yes, I'm a fucking hero. I'm sorry that I have to scream it at you, but I gotta tell myself that. I need this little bit of reassurance today about what my life has been all about. God damn it, as I think back to all of those stories, I feel so fucking proud and so fucking good about what I did. God damn it. And I guess I better end there as I'm standing, glaring, staring into the sun shining on the sea and it's sparkling and it's 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 god screaming back to me that's what's happening folks as the the sun dazzles on the waves and it's it's absolutely beautiful and brilliant and light and i'm alive standing on this fucking corner on this pier on this point in this park it's just fucking all so wonderful and i'm alive like i was alive when i was in my 20s This is great. This is just fucking great.
everybody wants you to fit in and, and, and there's ways of doing things and it's logical and some of us just aren't built that way and I think a lot of you listeners will understand that maybe you will operate on these strange principles too and so if anything I'd like this to be a message of encouragement don't give up if this is who you are and how you work don't be forced to conform. Don't give up. Don't lose faith in yourself. Don't sell out. Don't try to fit in that box if it doesn't feel right. Carry on and believe in yourself. If you lose that belief in yourself, you've lost everything. You've really got to have it. And damn it, it gets really hard at times because it's as if the world around you, including sometimes friends, family, co-workers, conspire to put you in a spot that you don't necessarily want to be in. And it's very, very, very hard to go your own way and to be a loner and to stick to your guns and just to, to have the faith that what you're doing is right. I, 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 I mean, I just, that's just true. It's hard. And I just encourage each and any one of you to, to look for where those, that faith comes from, to dig deep inside yourself, to uh, do what it takes to, to not sell your soul, to not give up, to just keep, keep believing in yourself. It's hard. And there you go. Wish I could say I love you all, but uh, that would be kind of bullshit because I don't even know who you are, but uh, I'd like it to be true. Bye for now. EXO EPISODE 24 CARRY ON We're bound to wait all night She's bound to run a mile Invested in nothing at any height To reach his own The garden is sorting out She curls her lips on her bow I don't know You can find Scarborough Dudes Podcast at dixonjanes.blogspot.com. I'd like to give special thanks to Eric from the show Tip Tap Tip in Calgary. He's the one who first recognized that my podcast and Ken's podcast are so similar and recommended to Ken that he get in touch with me. So thanks, Eric, for <laughs> hooking us up, you know, uniting us. To go check out Eric's show, go to tiptaptip.com. A lot of the music from this episode is from a band called Broken Bells that was recommended to me by my friend Devin, and she recommends all kinds of great stuff to me. So I'd like to give her an EXO shout-out as well. For more episodes of XO, please visit KeithCourage.com. The dawn to end all night. The song hoped it would break from the warfare in your house. To each his own. The soldiers bailing out. He curled his lips on the bow. And I don't know what the dead can talk.
Yeah. Good morning once again. Gee, this is probably only, let's see, if that was not 1 o'clock and it's now, what, 11 o'clock, only that would be 10 hours ago that I um, spoke to you last in my office, sobering up for the drive home, and <laughs> oh, I have my route planned. Okay, which is the route to go where I'm not likely, perhaps, to uh, see any police or anything, you know, which which would be a safe easy, direct route to get home, just in case. And at the very last minute, as soon as I came to the first turn, I took a different route. I said, no, I'm going to go along Kingston Road. And I had this strange premonition that that's where the police would be, you know, man, along Kingston Road at 1 o'clock. Of course, that's where we're going to, because that's sort of the strip from all the bars and everybody heading back to Scarborough and Pickering or wherever you're going. You know, and so I knew in my mind this wasn't the route to go. And sure enough, a few blocks down the way, just past Vic Park, uh, where I had been drinking earlier, there's a police roadblock. You know, a, a ride check to uh, check your alcohol level. <laughs> and I saw that. And of course, I didn't panic. I had waited long enough. You know, I probably hadn't had a, a drink since 10 or so. And this was one, so I was okay. And, and even then, only three points. But I had a tote, too, which gives you a little bit of an edge. So spit my gum out, because that's always a bad sign, you know. You're chewing gum, it looks like you're trying to hide something. Yeah. Roll down the window, and then stopped exactly where he had his hand out. So I was showing I was in total control of my car. And, um, hey, sir, had anything to drink tonight? And uh, right away I answered, yeah, I had a beer or a supper, but that was about four hours ago. All right, thank you, bye-bye. And that was it. Now... The only mistake I made was I felt I had to say something. I wanted to kind of thank them for doing spot checks. You know, this is, you just, hey, don't complicate things. Count your blessings and get the hell out of there. Uh, but I had my window down, and just as I pulled away, uh, I called back, carry on. And I, I don't know why I said that. It was a pretty stupid thing to say to the police. You know, it was, you know, it was my shorthand way of saying, you're doing a great job, keep it up. Carry on, as if I was the uh, inspector general telling my coppers what to do. Anyway, I, uh, I was relieved to get home, and then sure enough. I got